Hi, good morning, guys. Uh, my, uh, name my name is Munis, and, uh, and I'm a sophomore here at Main High School. School. And I'm president of this Techies Club. And today we're uh, hosting some of the third events where we have guest speakers come in and uh, talk to us about uh, technical education and future careers in education and how they got the point and help us to see it in the future overall. Uh, so today we have two wonderful people from Biologic. Uh, one is Mr. Derek Lourdes. Uh, and we have Mr. Eric Abbas. Uh, all right. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right. Thanks for, Thanks for coming in early, early, everyone. Really I really uh, appreciate, it. appreciate it. It's like we all woke up on time to uh, make it here for the uh, uh, for the event. Um. So again, my name is Derek. I uh, run a local technology company called FireLogic, which are right here in Berkridge. Uh, Erica works, works with us as well. Uh, she, uh, she is one of our lead desk, desk, uh, support people on staff. And uh, we both have a very close history to uh, District 207. We're both former students. We're both former employees of the district. So we've been uh, around the block here. For more, more than a few years, years. Uh, and you know, what I really wanted to come, come back, you know, when Mr. Kinsley asked, asked me to, to come by and to speak to everyone, you know, I really love, uh, you know, coming back, you know, where I graduated, where I used to work, and and, and sharing, you know, some of the knowledge, some of the things that I've gone through, some of the things that helped me, and you know, some of my turning points in, in, in not only my personal life, my professional life as well. Um, to be able to flourish with the technology, something I've I've really grown to love. I'm Hoping that you guys have a passion for technology. I presume that's probably why you're, you know, in the crowd and and uh, you know looking to learn some of those things as well. So uh, I'm going to share a lot of those tidbits today. I do encourage you to you know, ask questions. Uh, if you have a small question as we're going along, that should be just fine. If you want to ask, uh, if it's something a little more formal, we're going to take a little bit longer. Uh, I hope to dedicate, you know, perhaps 10, 15 minutes or so at the end uh, to a QA and uh, with everyone. Okay. <clears throat> so one thing I like to share when I talk to the students is uh, I actually shared this when I was uh, at career fair uh, last year, uh, right, right over at, at uh, Main South. South. Uh, so tech, tech support. support for a little uh, funny, funny slide I like to start off with. with. All, my All my friends think that, that I do. Repairing, repairing computers. I'm talking about the electric thing over there. My mom, My mom, of course, course thinks, thinks I'm all uh, over Einstein, Einstein, working at computers all the time. But of course, society calls us all geeks. I wouldn't say that's necessarily the case. There's nothing wrong with being a geek. But, you know, we're not all corny like uh, this guy in this picture over here. Uh, this one doesn't necessarily apply to me since I am the boss, so I'm going to skip that slide. Uh, but I did have some former coworkers that did get caught sleeping on the job. <laughs> so it was fairly out of the wall. Um, what I think I do, it's a photo from uh, Star Trek. And what I actually do, Google, my best friend. <laughs> I'm sure everyone else uses Google quite a bit. You know, we do it uh, day to day in, in our lives as well, uh, professionally. And you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm going to cover why there's nothing wrong with that a little bit later in my, in my presentation. You know, it's not always about being that encyclopedia. It's about knowing where to go to find the answers to problems that you're having. And I'm going to mention why that's important as I continue on here. <clears throat> if you just came in while we're adjusting something, um, I have a few handouts. I'll be referencing uh, these two exams, CompTIA Network Plus and A Plus. I brought some informational handouts on that and then sort of a, not agenda sheet, but uh, some things I'll be covering in terms of uh, some summary items, some topics that I'm covering here today. So. You can feel free to grab one if you'd like. All right. Back to it. <clears throat> so everyone likes to ask me where my passion for technology came from. I wouldn't say I was 
always as passionate as I am in technology, you know, it was sort of a, it was sort of a course, it was sort of a, an adventure, you know, that really started for me in earnest in high school, well, before that, I mean, there's a lot of things, as I'll show, that came up previously to that, uh, you know, I would like to call my progression in the field of IT or my growing love for IT and working in this field, I like to call it a story of firsts. What do I mean by a story of firsts? My first computing experience. I always start off a little bit earlier than most of you guys. I remember, I have, well, I have some memories back in, I think, kindergarten or first grade going to the computer lab. We had one computer lab. I used to go to Car Carpenter School, elementary school, over in Park Ridge. Uh, and, and it was, it was one of my favorite parts of when we got to go to the computer lab and use the Apple IIs or Apple threes. I forget exactly what they were. Uh, but we had to check out five, five and a quarter inch floppy disks, disks to, go to go ahead and be able to use these computers. computers. So, so we had to pull, pull the disk out, you rent to the disk, library, library card, pop it in the computer, the computer and, and then you were able to play very simple you know, typing games or, or working, things, things like, like that. So that was exciting when I was, you know, four or five years old or so. So that was. That was my first experience uh, with computers, and you know, it only progressed from there. She's having a great time with that five and a quarter floppy. <laughs> my first computer was a blazing fast Sony Bio computer. Sony doesn't even make computers anymore; they just exited the industry. Um, but I had a big CRT monitor that came with it, a blazing fast. I think, I think it was 330 megahertz Google, Google Core processor. I mean, Hailed in comparison to anything that's out of the market today. Uh, but I love my, my personal computer, even though it took up my entire desk. And I uh, had a lovely home house. I was able to play my first PC games and uh, use Windows for the first time and have my own computer. It was you know, quite an experience for me. And I went over the course of upgrading my memory. I doubled my RAM in my system. And, and I thought that was the coolest thing that uh, I could do. So um, my first computer. I'm sure everyone has their own experience. First copy of Windows I ever used. Way back when, Windows 95. So this was one of the first versions of Windows that had a graphical interface. Minesweeper was a big deal because you could play a game that was not in a command prompt on a, on a green screen. So um, Windows has come a long way. Computers have come a long way since you know, the days of the mid-90s. Um, but that was uh, the fun and joy that I had with Windows 95 with my first computer. My first, first PC game, the very original Doom. Very, very funny. funny. I never got to play the game with sound. I thought PC games didn't come with sound. sound. I really, I really thought, thought that they just weren't games that didn't have any sound. sound. And the reason being is because my computer, for some reason, didn't have drivers that worked with my copy of Doom. So I just played the game without sound. I said, oh, PC computing, you know, PC gaming is just not the fun as console gaming. So, um, yeah, I never got to fix that, but later on I found out from my cousin that you know games actually did have sound, and my computer was just a little screwed up. So my first experience on the internet was a dial-up. I don't know, has anyone here used dial-up internet? Some of the older crowd have used dial-up. It was a lovely experience. You would sit there and wait for your modem to connect to the internet service. And if you were unlucky to not have a second phone line that you could use just for dial-up internet, you were stuck with angry parents that were telling you to get off the internet because they had to make phone calls. So, uh, yeah, one of the one of the many downsides of dial-up internet uh, that you couldn't make a phone call while you were on the on the phone line with it. Um, downloading music took hours at a time. I mean, everything that we take for granted today on fast internet was definitely not the case on on dial-up. First time I got to use Google when I was in at Emerson in middle school, probably a sixth or seventh grade, using Google, using Google on the old colorful Macs that they had over at uh, over at Emerson. And this is how Google used to look. Very plain. Well, it still kind of looks the same way. It hasn't changed very much. Um, but uh, Google did just fine with a very plain interface. I bet. I guess. I was using a tablet before the iPad was ever out. People think that the iPad was the first tablet. It was not the first tablet. There was a 
line of computers called tablet PCs before the iPad ever came out or any of those devices. I owned one of these when I entered college. I used to take notes on one of these devices. I actually still have a style laptop like this today, quite ironically. Um, but these were the first tablet computers. And uh, I was sitting there in college taking notes on this when other people were on large laptops or just using notebooks. And they called me crazy. Well, how the tables have turned in just about a half decade. Um, this was a case where the hardware was way ahead of the software, uh, just like anyone that's used Windows XP and how buggy it was used to be and how many blue screens it got. Uh, that experience on a tablet was quite pitiful. So um, you know, the one application I gave it justice was OneNote. If you've ever used OneNote, I was using the first version of OneNote when that came out uh, back in 2004, 2005. <clears throat> My first smartphone, a Windows Mobile Pocket PC smartphone. Um, this was about the year 2006 or so. I was just out of high school. I was uh, uh, probably a second year in college or first year in college at that point. Uh, and I was working for a competitor of mine in town, actually. I'm not going to name any names. And we were issued these smartphones. They ran a consolidated little small version of Windows XP. If Windows XP was bad on a desktop computer, imagine how bad it was on a little phone like this. It was bad. You had to close out of programs that froze with your task manager. It was pitiful. So be glad that we have Androids and iPhones now that make life a lot, lot simpler. Um, but uh, yeah, my first experience with smartphones was quite bad. I hated, hated, hated this phone. Then I moved to BlackBerry, and I, and I, liked, I liked those. <clears throat> Um, my first IT certification, some of you have probably heard of this. If you're looking to get into the IT industry, and I'm going to mention this at a few other points uh, during the presentation, my first IT certification I got when I was, uh, that was the um, summer before I entered my senior year. I actually took the A-plus class that was here at Maine East. I don't know if they, do they still offer A-plus? Oh, <laughs> what a question. Um, so I took, I took A-plus with an awesome teacher named uh, Mr. Hunter. People, none of you probably ran into him. One of my favorite teachers I ever had uh, in high school. Gave me a lot of motivation. One of, you know, one of the people that really gave me my boost and you know, told me, you know what, IT really is for you. So I took the A-plus class my junior year. I actually had to travel from Maine South to Maine East early in the morning because they didn't have it at Maine South. So I actually had to take a little bus, a little mini bus, to Maine East every morning and then back for my first period. So... That was my, my, my junior and senior year were filled with taking uh, that class and the Network Plus I did uh, my senior year. Uh, it was a pain in the rear. It was time consuming, but you know, that was really my first go into getting my hands onto computers and getting a feel for what you know, working in technology really was like. So I, packed, I took the class. I took the exam uh, summer before I entered my senior year, and I passed it. I ended up taking the Network Plus then, which is the one step above this. Um, the spring, a uh, spring break of my senior year, and there we go. Before I graduated high school, I had my first two IT certifications, and it helped me because I was able to get a job my senior year. I was actually working, doing what I'm doing now. I was, I was actually doing IT consulting um, before I left high school, and I was doing that for probably the last half of my uh, senior year. So life was was busy. I didn't have as much time for uh, friends or hanging out, you know, because I was working after school, but I enjoyed it. I really, I love technology, and I was glad to be able to start doing something that I, uh, that I really loved. Um, and if you're curious what A-plus is about, I actually, I have a handout. One of my handouts over there is about the A-plus exam. Uh, if you're looking to get into any of the IT jobs, sort of the side of IT that we work on, support and infrastructure and networking, this is really the base level exam that a lot of employers look for. It, it, as a matter of fact, we just hired two people, and that was one of our requirements, is that you either have A-plus or that you gain your A-plus certification within a few months of working for us. So uh, it is something that's accepted actually globally. It's a global exam. It states that, hey, I know technology to a point where I can repair computers, troubleshoot things, have the people skills to work with others on issues, uh, things of that nature. So um, you know, definitely something to look into if you're really interested about going into the people support side of, um, side of IT. <clears throat> and my first tech job, so this is where my career really started, was 
actually right here at the district, at Maine South. So before I was even working doing IT consulting my senior year for one of my competitors right now, um, I actually took a, a position as a, well, I was like a writing lab assistant before I started into an actual intern. I was a technology department intern. And, uh, you know, the department, they gave me a chance. They knew I was really interested. I was always hanging around the department trying to, you know, see how much more I could help out and things of that nature. And they said, you know what, we'll give you a chance. Come on. This was my summer after my junior year. And they said, you know, let's give it a shot. Let's see what, you know, if you really like this. And I worked that summer, and then I worked throughout the year a little bit of my senior year, after my senior year as well a little bit. And, um, you know, that's really where uh, I, I got my start. And, and, you know, it wasn't only myself. Uh, I was wanted to wait a little bit longer, you know, to, 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 to say what Erica, you know, how we got introduced. But when I actually was came back to work at Maine South uh, in technology, Erica actually was one of the interns that came to work for us when I was a formal employee like Mr. Knizzo here in technology. So... Everything kind of comes full circle. So Erica was used to be very quiet and a little bashful. She was, you know, editor in chief of Equinox, the 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 the, the, the magazine uh, over at Maine South. Um, but you know, I was really hesitant. I really didn't know if you know Erica was going to be a good fit to work with teachers and students in technology. Um, you know, but she ended up surprising us. She was actually one of our best interns that we ever had. And you know, as Things progressed. I'll actually, we'll get to her in just a moment. Um, but and things ended up coming for a full circle, and she actually works with us now. She's one of our full-time workers, and she provides our day-to-day -day phone and remote support for customers. So, uh, you know, anyone that says that real things don't start in high school, they are completely wrong. That is couldn't be any further from the uh, from the truth. <clears throat> uh, just a brief moment about how my company started. Uh, Fire Logic. That was another journey as well. It wasn't something that you know I just you know woke up one day and said oh, I'm going to write a business plan and you know start my company. You know it really wasn't like that. And I, I feel the more I talk with people in the IT industry and technology, the more I hear that you know this is kind of you know it's it's never where you wake up and you have that formal plan. You have that plan of attack. It's sort of something that falls in your lap or you know you sort of give a try and it's something you enjoy and you end up going down that direction uh, and, and that's kind of how it happened to me so my company used to be a hobby I used to do just computer repair for friends and family probably like a lot of you do doing virus cleanup doing my hard drive died can you replace my hard drive can you reinstall windows for me simple stuff like that um, so that turned into a part-time business and when I was working at Maine South uh, for four years I actually started this halfway through and and, you know, I was doing so much of it that, you know, for a few reasons, I went ahead and, and formalized it as a business because of, you know, how much money I was making on the side with it. It made sense to go ahead and do that. Uh, it ended up blossoming into something more. It ended up blossoming actually into a full-time job. I was actually working and running FireLogic at the same time as I was working at Maine South and doing technology over there. And, you know, lunch breaks were were with you know doing customer calls, and after work I was going out and doing customer work. So it became so much where I said, you know what, I got to pick one or the other, either you know working for Maine South or doing FireLogic. And my real passion came out in running FireLogic and and growing that. As you know, I felt there was a need to offer friendly computer service in the area. You know, I, I I've heard of the experiences with Geek Squad and some of the other big box stores out there, and I said, uh, you know. There's a better way to do this. This can be done better. You know, if you ever watch Shark Tank on 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 NABC, you know, there's always that question. You know, can it be done better? You know, that's what I always thought. There is a better way to do this, and that's really what gave me some of that motivation to to go ahead and start this. Uh, so a part-time hobby, something I did on the side, is now a we're a ten-person company as of uh, this week. Um, Ten people between full-time and part-timers um, providing small business and mid-sized business technology support. So, you know, we sort of fill into the gap of companies that are, you know, a little bit too large for the business owner to be doing everything on his own, um, but too small for someone to hire a professional IT person on their staff. So that's where we fall in. We are the outsourced IT department for a lot of 
small businesses in the area. We still do residential support. We do a lot of computer repair for homes and, 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 and residents in the area, um, but small business, mid-sized business support is where we really are starting, starting to uh, you know, fall into to play. Um, and if you're curious what this is over here, uh, we actually got a chance to do a commercial with Microsoft. It actually went live uh, last April or so. We filmed it in November of 2013. Uh, you probably never saw it on TV because it didn't broadcast on TV. It was meant for IT professionals that were looking at using the Surface tablets in the workplace. Uh, so we filmed that, uh, and that went live on YouTube. It's got like almost 9,000 views, so um, partial YouTube star. Um, <laughs> um, as a side note, I'm never going to go into acting. We shot a two-minute commercial. It turned out to be a two-minute commercial. It took us 13 hours of filming. It is exhausting work to be in acting, and I never want to do it. So anytime you see a movie and you think acting's easy, give those actors props, because it is painstaking labor to go ahead and record uh, things professionally. Uh, so you can watch that on YouTube if you ever just go ahead and search FireLogic Surface up on YouTube. <clears throat> so Erica, I wanted to spend a brief moment about her, you know, her uh, and how she got her rise. Actually, I'll let her take the floor. I provided sort of a roadmap for some of the her direction and where she's gone in professionally, and she's still quite young. Do you want to share your age? Is that okay, Erica? Sure, that's fine. Um, I'm only 21, so she's still in college. She's still she's still going to DePaul University. Uh, in you're going for a bachelor's in graphic design. Graphic design. So I started at Maine South working. Uh, this is my first true technology job, and it started, they sent out a school-wide email to all the students, and they had said, if you're interested, send us your resume and a cover letter. And I'm like, well, it's about time I got a job. My dad's probably going to kill me if I'm sitting around all summer. So I applied, uh, interviewed, and they liked me, and I came back. I worked there the whole summer, and I made it more than what it needed to be, really. I mean, we weren't asked to do some of the stuff that I did, but... The job's what you make it, and I turned it into um, an internship for my internship class during this, my senior year, and, and I continued to work there the next summer before I started college, and I was doing pretty much most of the stuff that the full-time staff was doing there. Um, once I went to college, I got other jobs at other places. Um, the second job at the company CorpTax I worked at that was a similar position helping with the full-time help desk support um, got to be a little far for me so um, and a better opportunity over at CMAP came up since it was right in the loop um, that was just internal IT support for only a year um, so I after that I got another offer at this other company which is a larger MSP type of company so we were taking calls and MSP stands for managed service provider that's sort of direction that our company is heading it is more of a formalized approach to being outsourced IT for a small business so it wasn't just like break fix we were getting tickets day in and day out and constantly on the phone or somebody was out on site um, versus like the other two places where it was like we were just servicing that office only, kind of similar to what you would do here, um, except it was not as intense in my opinion. Um, and then finally I came here because um, it was closer and it was a lot, it's a lot of a better fit for me. I'm doing what I really like to do and it makes me happy you know, that I, to go to work, I'm not, like, really bummed out. I don't have to wake up at 5.30 to make sure that I can get there by 8 on time because it's not like I have to sit on the train, you know. And I don't mind it, but this is a lot better. It makes me a lot happier, a lot less grumpy, more time for to do balance from, like, school, work, and hanging out with friends and doing whatever I want to do, so. <clears throat> yeah, one thing, one thing I want to stress, and I'm glad Erica brought that up, is if you can't get up and be very happy and be excited to go to work, you know, some people find work to be, you know, a bore or, you know, not fun or exciting. If you don't get that kind of drive from the, the, the path that you're going and you don't feel that, how are you going to last doing that professionally for 30, 40 years, you know, for the rest of your life? Think about that. I really want you to think about that because a lot of people go through life 
and do something that they don't really enjoy and said, I'm just doing it for the benefits or I'm doing it because of where the job is located. You know, there's a certain point in your life where you have to say, okay, I need to figure out what gives me my drive and my passion. And if you can't do that, if you can't have that kind of excitement about going to work, that's how I feel every single day. Um, I have to work long hours and weekends and, you know, a lot of things that I didn't expect to be doing as a small business owner, but I enjoy it because I love the job that I do. You have to be able to ask that question of yourself and see if that is where you see yourself, you know, down the road. And that, that might not be IT. That may be something else. So that may be a side of IT that you did not uh, expect. You know, I didn't walk into becoming an intern at Maine South and know right away that I was going to love doing the support side of technology. You know, it was something that grew on me. It was something that, you know, fell in my lap and I sort of, you know, took and ran with it and found that that's where my enjoyment was. Um, you know, even though I used to be shy in high school and didn't like to talk that much, and now I have no problem getting up and doing presentations and training with, you know, groups of users out in a crowd. It doesn't bother me that much, you know. So it, it really sometimes takes a little bit of getting out of your comfort zone to figure out what it is that you're really going to love doing in life. <clears throat> so where do we work in terms of the IT? So FireLogic, or what me and Erica do for customers, um, this is sort of how I see the field of IT, the different areas that are out there. Um, you know, some people like to, to, to stigmatize it as sort of the coding side and the everything else side. There's a few more pieces of the puzzle than just that. I'm sure there's people in this crowd that have interests in, you know, different areas here, which is great. IT is such a big field. It's not where you have to pigeonhole yourself into one thing. Uh, but, but the areas that we specialize in and what I love doing, what we love doing, uh, the support and training side, as we already said, we work on the hardware side, so repairing computers, fixing motherboards. I actually, that was my first real computer class at, at Maine East, as I said, the A-plus class. I enjoyed that. I love that, getting my hands on computers and fixing them uh, myself. Some people love repairing cars. I love repairing computers, so that's where that passion came from. Uh, networking side of things, so connecting and putting in the infrastructure to be able to make a lab like this talk to everyone else and talk to the Internet. Uh, so we do a lot of that these days as well. Uh, and, of course, security. Security, as you all know, um, with as much hacking has been going on and DDoS attacks that have been happening in the industry, you know, small businesses need support for that too, and we come in to fill that gap uh, for them. Uh, two of the things in IT that we don't do, we used to do a little bit of development on the website side. We don't do that anymore. Um, it's a totally different direction in IT. It was something that I don't have a passion in. I don't like development. I don't like programming. I never was that kind of person. My brother is a programmer. He works throughout the night for some kind of Japanese uh, auto import um, company, and uh, you know he works overnight and sleeps during the day, uh, but he loves to program. It's, it's just a different personality. You know, I'm a little more outgoing on the, the people side of things. He's more analytical and driven to, to code perfectly, you know. So it, it just depends. You know, there's nothing wrong with either side. You just need to find what you really love to do and, and, and give it a try and go down that path uh, for yourself. Data warehousing, that's sort of an all-encompassing term for people that work with databases and big data, if you've heard of that, all the big data centers and that hold all the data from insurance records to banking records. There are people that need to maintain those systems, so that's sort of like the, uh, uh, called uh, data warehousing. We really don't deal with that aspect either. <clears throat> um, one of the biggest things that we do, you know, people think, oh, we just work with technology to work with technology. <clears throat> we are solving problems. This is as much a technology company and as it is a people and a service company, right? I mean, we're using technology to solve end goals. You know, questions that we get asked all the time, you know, problems that people need solved. How can I put servers in the cloud? How can I get my workforce to be using tablets instead of desktop computers? You know, how can I get Wi-Fi across my entire campus or, or property or building? You know, these are questions, real business needs and things that people need solved. So, I love solving problems, and I love technology. And this is really the great marriage of those two things, because I get to work with both sides of that uh, in the field you know, that we're in. <clears throat> so some of the skills that I, I, I want to make sure everyone knows that you know, are necessary, if you're looking to get into a job or go into the career if area of, of networking or uh, uh, especially uh, end user support or help desk uh, into, into more training position, you know, there are some soft skills that employers are looking for, things that really you start growing 
the latter part of high school and especially in college, and these are the things that employers are looking for. This is what I was looking for when I was hiring people just a few weeks ago. So, you know, it's not always about grade point average. It's not always just about the technical skills that you have or every encyclopedic thing, the nugget that's in your brain. A lot of it is the things that you can't touch, you can't put your hands on. People skills, the biggest item, have to have good people skills. If you're interacting with end users not, or, and with staff, anyone, I mean, most jobs, unless you're on the programming side and really doing, you know, digging yourself into code, you have to deal with people, you have to deal with customers and other staff members. People skills, being able to talk about things and, and relate to others and, uh, you know, interoperate with others, very, very important. And, you know, high school teaches you a lot of those things, even more so in college as well, but, you know, that's something that, Employers, at least in my side of the IT arena, are looking for most definitely, maybe above and, above and beyond all else, you know, on your resume. Troubleshooting skills. Can you go in? Can you solve a problem? You know, when I was doing interviews, interviewing people, I had some of the biggest brainiacs come in, and yet they couldn't explain to me how they would troubleshoot an issue if a virus got on a computer. You know, simple question like, if your mother's computer got a virus, what would be the steps you'd go through in trying to solve that? I'm not looking for the answers of what antivirus program you're using or what particular aspect of Windows you went into to solve that. I want to see how you think. I want to see how you solve issues and problems and how you tackle and jump on items. And some of those skills are tested in, that, in the CompTIA A plus exam. So they try to dig that in and, 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 and really state the importance of that. But troubleshooting, thinking through problems logically, even if you don't know the answer, knowing how to jump and tackle and jump into an issue is just as important as knowing the resolution for that problem. It really is. Time management, uh, obviously a big concern. Time is money, especially when you're working in the private sector these days. Even, uh, even in, the, in the public side, if you're working for a school district like I used to or a government job, time management is always critical. If you're someone that overanalyzes everything and never gets anything done because you want to work to perfection, you need to be able to hone some of those skills and you know, step back and say, okay, I need a balance between perfection and speed. You need to find that, that middle spot for yourself. Teamwork, working in teams, very, very important. We do a lot of group work in high school, college, there's even more group work that you're gonna be doing. Um, but the reason that you do so much of that is because there's so much teamwork that goes on in the, in the job field, in the, in the career arena these days, especially in IT. When we're working on projects, installing wiring, or putting in servers, or upgrading networks, there are usually multiple parties, multiple different vendors, multiple people from the customer side that need to be involved on a project, and multiple staff members on your own team that need to know where things are, and you need to be able to work with them uh, in a good fashion. You know, um, I always say you need to be able to work on things in a solo manner, as well as on a team, equally well, because IT calls for both of those if you're looking to get ahead and, and get into the IT arena. Um, you have to have a willingness as well to learn constantly. IT is a field that is always changing. As I showed you in some of those first slides that I brought up there, my first computer, my first tablet computer, some of those things were only about you know, 10, 15 years ago. Sounds like a long time. It's not that long. It goes, just goes to show that our industry moves so fast. If you don't have a passion for things that change constantly and are always evolving, and if you don't want to keep up with those changes, IT may not be the best field for you because it's going to change so fast and it's going to leave you in the dust. You have to be able to keep your skills, your skill set, and your knowledge about what's going on up to date and not be afraid of change. It is not a career path for someone that is afraid of change. You know, you'd be better suited going into you know, marketing or you know, what are the more other... Uh, um, areas, uh, other careers that, you know, don't have that kind of constant influx of change. Um, and this is actually something I just added to the slide last night. Geek speak translation ability. What do you think I mean by that? Geek speak. Someone tell me, what's geek speak? Exactly, right? I guess they have a coworker on our staff that had a problem with, you know, going up to a client and always talking and saying, uh, you know, Mr. Customer, your CPU and your RAM were uh, not properly uh, uh, set up and the voltages were wrong and I had to change the front side bus and this and that. The average person doesn't care about that much detail, right? I don't care what the mechanic had to do exactly deep down in my engine as long as it's fixed and as long as he can relate that to me. 
we have to be aware of that in the technology side. There's a lot of people that have a tough time with that. Even though you have a lot of knowledge in your brain, you can't convert that into average person speak, right? Us geeks, we think in a different level. That's fine. But we have to be able to remember that there are a lot of people out there that don't think and can't talk on our level of CPU and RAM and VPNs and firewalls and all that other stuff. We need to be able to translate that. So geek speak is something that I have to wade through in our hiring process and make sure that no one that couldn't filter out the geek speak made it on board because that is difficult, something very difficult to change and instill in someone. <clears throat> on my handout that I provided, if you didn't get one, you can grab one on your way out today or if you want to grab one right now. Um, on one of the sides of the handout I put up there, 25 hottest skills from 2014 on LinkedIn. Surprise, surprise, 19 of the top 25 skills on that list are all IT skills. IT is very hot. Six of those skills actually are related to the field that, that Erica and I are in, and the infrastructure support side of the field, networking side of things. Um, so IT is very hot. IT is not going anywhere, even though we have our ups and downs. You know, it's a little bit of a tumultuous industry. We had a period of outsourcing and programming jobs, which is starting to come back to the United States. Um, there's no such thing as computers going away. There's no such thing as you know being able to outsource all the IT jobs. There is a growing demand for IT people. There will always be a demand for IT people uh, for as long as smartphones are in every pocket, a tablet's in every backpack, and a computer is on every desk. There will be a need for people like us. So have no fear. Even if there's one side of IT that you feel like you know maybe doesn't have as many jobs, there's so many different things you can do in IT. Don't pigeonhole yourself. There may be something out there that you don't even know about uh, that you may enjoy. You know, network and information security, very big. Uh, number one, statistical analysis. I did not expect that to be number one, but again, with how much data is out there, out in the wild, someone has to be able to make sense of it. That's probably why it's number one hottest skill uh, from last year. Business intelligence. Algorithm design, more from the programming side, the logic behind programs and, and databasing and things like that. Um, Mac, Linux, and Unix systems, right? Some of the other side of computers that are not Windows machines. So big need and growing need for things like that. So you can look at the whole list, but the predominant majority are IT skills. So have no fear. These things are definitely sought after, and, and you'll have no problem finding a job uh, you know, once you graduate, as long as you, um, you know, put yourself to it in, 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 in some part of the uh, IT field. Uh, from 2014, some of the hot technology jobs, the top six, uh, a few of those, again, are from our side of the field, infrastructure side, network engineers, systems engineers, IT quality assurance, data warehousing, that big data, databasing stuff I was talking about, and security professionals. So as you can see, you know, a lot of interesting stuff that you can do and you can uh, go into uh, in terms of IT. Uh, and just some of the headlines that were in a lot of the big publications. U.S. News said last year for the first time the number one job in America wasn't from healthcare, it was technology. Surprise, surprise. Top IT skills for 2014, big data, mobile, cloud, security, all those things that you hear about in the news. Big need and growing needs you know, for people that have those kind of skills. So again, tech job forecast for 2014, hot and still getting hotter. Again, no shortage of jobs out there for IT professionals. How to get your foot in the door, I just want to spend a brief moment on this. Um, if it wasn't clear that you should look at becoming an intern at an organization that you know or a place that might be offering an internship, might not be a bad idea to jump in there. So what I did when I was in high school, Erica did the same, and you know we're now in positions where we really love what we do in technology. So definitely jump into an internship, get a feel for some of the things that you enjoy in technology. It won't hurt you to try something out of your comfort zone. You may find yourself enjoying something you didn't expect. Entry-level IT certifications, for some fields may not be necessary. For my side of the support and networking side, there is a, a, a big value placed on these. Uh, and again, A plus Network Plus from CompTIA. I've got Pat on the side. You can grab a handout on those. Those are entry-level exams. That is for anyone entering the IT industry to go ahead and uh, you know, get those certifications and prove your knowledge. Not prove that you're an expert, but be able to say that you can be trained and be able to say that you know what you know and also that you... Uh, um, <clears throat> lost my train of thought there. 
Uh, and also, don't be afraid to look for a position that isn't in your number one area of interest in terms of internships. As I said, I did not expect to love IT support as much as I do if I didn't go into you know my my internship what I did uh, at Maine South my senior year. So jump out, give it a try. You may be surprised uh, with what you like. <clears throat> If you're looking for people to reach out to for re as a resource uh, for helping you out and getting you some information in terms of where should I go in IT, right? That was something that I asked myself, and I found those resources and the tech department at Maine South, and also you know some others that were in the industry that I was able to talk with. My job that I started working at my senior year of high school, um, career counselors. We have them at the high school level. We have them in college as well. They're a great resource. They talk to a lot of people people that have gone into job fields and they have that feedback for how they enjoy, what they enjoy, what skill sets they have to have, and what they can expect from different jobs. So very good people to be able to speak with. And online. I know all of you are online all the time. For, you know, forums online, Reddit, Facebook, all these different avenues. You know, there's not only, you know, fun stuff and, 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 and uh, you know, conversations about, you know, Super Bowl going on. There are conversations about where you like to work, what kind of things do you like to do in life, you know, asking others how they feel about the technology industry or what they do in their job day to day. So reach out on those avenues. The people are out there, they're willing to discuss it. I know they are because I use those things when I was still in high school, so uh, it's definitely out there. Um, and then just a brief moment on starting your own business. Um, you know, sometimes people ask me, if you know what you know now and, uh, you know, with how much it entails running a business and all the long hours and weekends that I have to work and paperwork and blah, 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 blah that I have to worry about with running a business, you know, would I do it again? <laughs> Probably, you know, but there are some times when, <laughs> you know, those uh, 60, 70 hours, 80 hour weeks where, you know, you start to ask yourself, is this really <laughs> what I should have done with myself? But in all reality, I really enjoy running a small business. Um, there are a lot of people that um, starting a business uh, that is, you know, is probably the path that you should go down. There are some that shouldn't go into it. And I, on the back of my sheet that I made with the LinkedIn top 25 jobs, I put a lot of things to consider and things that, you know, whether or not you should or should not start a business because, uh, you know, a lot of people have a vision. I know I did of how glorious running a business is, and you know, I forgot about all the other sides of it that, uh, you know, are entailed with taxes and paperwork and managing workers and you know all the things I never had to worry about that now fell on my lap. So um, it's, it's a fun adventure running a company, being an entrepreneur. Uh, if you have that motivation, if you can get up every day and say, yes, I enjoy the challenge, I enjoy every day being a little bit different and not doing the same thing day in, day out, that could be a path for you, starting your own technology business. And what's great about starting a technology business, it doesn't require very much in terms of startup or startup capital, as you know, other people uh, tend to call that, right? If you have a laptop computer, a cell phone, and a bedroom that you can make phone calls from and work from, you can start a business. I mean, my company, FireLogic, started, my company, FireLogic, started in my bedroom of my condo when I was in college, and my dining room table was my workbench when I was repairing computers. Bring them back, repair them, and get them back out to customers. That's where FireLogic really began. Now we have a 1,300 square foot office space here in, in Park Ridge. So you know, it doesn't take a lot to start a technology business. But again, you have to ask yourself, you know, is, do you not mind the long hours? Do you not mind uh, you know, having to deal with managing people? Um, are you someone that likes to lead others? You know, uh, do you have that motivation where you can get up every day and, and, and grind it? and not worry about the ups and the downs, you know, because there are going to be a lot of downs. Not every day is a great, fabulous day. Uh, when you're running a small business, there are times where things are things are not going to go your way, and you know you're going to have to uh, you know kick it out and grind it out a little bit. So um, as long as you're okay with that, you know, starting a business might be something that uh, you might uh, you might really enjoy. Um, you know, as I said, there are long hours, uh, vacations, especially the first few years are are short and, and few in between, um, but when they do occur, you know, they're much deserved and welcome and, uh, um, you know, it's a journey. It's a journey. Just like my, my, my jump into IT, my career in IT has been a journey. It's a journey for Erica. You know, things you try and the path you go down, the career you go down, again, you just, the biggest thing is find that passion, find what you enjoy doing, branch out of your comfort zone, 
and you may be surprised with uh, you know what you end up liking and, and where you end up going in life in terms of IT. <clears throat> All right. Any questions? Go ahead. Uh, oh, go ahead and ask it on the on the microphone just so everyone else remotely can hear it. Are your company services available to like public the general public or are they limited to only private sources? Good question. They are you can walk in with your computer to our office and we will repair your computer and tell you what's wrong on the spot. So yes, we are open to the general public. Uh, anyone can use us. Uh, even though our specialty is in small and mid-sized business, we still do a lot of work for residential, uh, regular people, average computer users here in town in the local area. Um, so we still do both sides of it. So many others. There's got to be some more out there. Any questions? Go ahead and grab the mic. Uh, what are the various positions? What are the various positions that you have in the company? Like, uh, what kind of jobs do you have? <clears throat> at, our comp at our company, uh, since we're a very small company, we're not very rigid in terms of levels. Um, it's a very flat structure. Uh, it's me, um, so I manage the company, run the company day to day. I also am one of the lead consultants that goes out on site. I still do a lot of the network repair and server work and the day-to-day -day activities in terms of client-facing needs. Um, there are two others uh, that go ahead and handle uh, that same aspect uh, with us for on-site work, and there are also uh, two people, um, well, surely will be two people that handle sort of the phone calls, the remote support, handling customer repairs that come into the office, and that's sort of what Erica's side uh, does at our office. Uh, and then we also have uh, a few part-timers that help out with the, with the uh, residential computer repair. And then uh, my girlfriend is our front desk office manager that sort of is the glue to making sure everyone is where they're supposed to be um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So very small, uh, larger firms, very similar structure, but you have, again, you know, managers in place and things like that. But in general, that's kind of the structure that uh, you know, managed service providers uh, have of our nature. Okay. Anyone else? Any questions for Erica? I'm not the only one up here. <laughs> she graduated not too long ago, just a few years back, so she doesn't bite. Sure. What do you see yourself? Question for Erica. Erica, what do you see yourself doing <clears throat> after you graduate college? What is your goals over? the next few years, five years, and then later on in life? I'm really hoping to be doing something that I love. If it's in technology, if I decide to make a complete 360, um, either way, I just want to be doing what makes me happy. And I want to keep making progression in my education and my knowledge and stay motivated and just keep going in that motivation and just want to know more is really what kept me going in high school. If you, were to, if, you, if you would go to my past self and say, hey, this is what you're going to be doing in four or five years, I would be like, yeah, okay, you don't talk to people at all. It's like, no, you got to like just get out there and do it. And that's what I want to keep doing, <clears throat> just keep getting out there and staying motivated and doing what I like. And, and a lot of times it takes let what you enjoy, finding what you enjoy to take you out of that shell, right? You know, some of you may feel that way or may have felt that way previously in high school. I know I did. I was, again, very shy, do, had, you know, had a terrible time speaking in front of classes. I may remember my sophomore year, we had that communications class where we had to do speeches. Oh, my God, I almost had nervous breakdowns doing that. Now I'm, like, laughing at myself, like, how could I have not had an easy time with that, right? So sometimes it just takes getting a feel for where you enjoy being to get you out and, and, and find something that, that motivates you. And that's kind of the same, you know, same statement and path that I feel myself and Erica have both go down, gone down, and you know, it's only been for the better. Yeah, don't, don't ever be afraid. And if you think something might be out of your reach, you know what? The answer is you're probably going to be rejected if you never ask. A lot of employers, they don't want to take on part-time people, but the answer is 
a rejection until you ask them. So maybe like go out somewhere and say, hey, I, you know, I, this is what I like. This is what I want to do. You know, this is what I'm interested in. And who knows? The answer is no until you ask. So I would not be afraid of doing that. I mean, well, be careful, but <laughs> just be smart about it. But the, you know, keep that motivation. Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? Okay, I'd like to thank Mr. Lodars and Ms. Bosco for taking their time to come out and speak to us this morning. And, uh, we have a couple of minutes if you want to stay around uh, and ask a couple of individual questions, but uh, I'll have to uh, get out here in about five minutes to get to our first period classes. Thank you again for coming out, and thank you everybody for listening. Thanks for hosting us. I'm glad everyone came out.